And they say, oh, Yiddish writer, he must be sitting there with a long beard. And the, uh, the other, that. wasn't true. I mean, these were very cutting edge people. When I, when I propose this idea to you, like what work of Yiddish literature do you think most needs to be translated into English, I never expected you to tell me that you were to pick an American novel. People forget that Yiddish, in that sense, because it was never a language that had a country, was, had to be an international culture. And New York, by the end of the 19th, early part of the 20th century, especially by the end of, say, the first decade of the 20th century, was a major center of Yiddish literature. He certainly was a big shot and major figure and celebrity in the world of Yiddish literature and, and the Yiddish world in New York and internationally. He would travel to Europe about every three years. Uh, book tours, uh, conferences, stuff like that. When he would go there, he was this huge celebrity. I have a feeling that in his apartment building in Manhattan, uh, he was the nice gentleman in apartment 4C. Alpatasha was not in a vacuum there uh, in New York. There were other writers. Uh, his circle tended to be mostly poets, but that, I think, had more to do with who he chose to hang out with. There were plenty of other novelists. And people forget that there was a whole, just like there is in English, it's a whole range of Yiddish writing that appeals to different levels of people. And one of the things Yiddish had was this incredible high culture, this, you know, uh, avant-garde kind of thing. You know, the first productions of Strindberg and Ibsen to be done in any form in the United States were done in Yiddish, not in English. So these were some fairly hip guys. Of course, he knew all of world literature. I mean, uh, Alpatosha was fluent in six languages, so he would read everything that was being written in France in French and read everything being written in, Russia, in, in Russian. Alpatosha was in frequent correspondence with Marc Chagall, who, you know, likewise left Eastern Europe and went to the West and, uh, you know, became a lot more famous than Alpatosha did. When Chagall had to get out of France, uh, it were my grandfather, both of my grandfathers, the one that was the lawyer and, and Abatoshu, were the ones that had to sign for him, he will not become a burden on the country and blah, 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 to come in. He, uh, Chagall first took an apartment that wasn't far from my grandfather's in, uh, 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 he was a, in a classier neighborhood, but it was the, the it was basically Manhattan and, and uh, the west side of Manhattan. And he did a number of portraits of my grandfather. You know, there was a a circle of these people all over the world who stayed in touch by sending each other letters. And sometimes they were long and deep. Sometimes they were, you know, I need fifty bucks now, kind of thing. Uh, but there was this international Yiddish culture that was held together by language, not by place. And people were, they were aware of that. You know, it wasn't something that just kind of happened and in retrospect, somebody figured this out. These guys knew what was going on and they also knew that the language didn't have a great future. You know, you can read stuff from as early as 1908, not by Opatoshu, but by people uh, that he was friendly with and you know in that photo that we've got on the website of all the writers looking like gangsters It's by one of those guys who said like my he said maybe my kids will be able to read what I write My grandchildren will have no idea what I ever did. They simply won't know this language and That's like I said before World War one So they knew they were hoping they might be wrong but at least as far as America went, they, they realized that this was fighting against, uh, you know, fighting in a, an uphill battle, swimming against the stream. As far as what was going to happen in Europe, what subsequently happened in Europe, if the Holocaust goes, that, that's a whole other matter. You know, in 1921, when Empoile Schevelder came out, I don't think anybody foresaw quite what was going to 
quite what was going to happen. And it's a mistake to look at the literature backwards through that kind of lens.